As a rooted deeply and forward-looking community, we hope that you will be blessed by this message. For more information, visit rechurchza.com. I always get, um, I think they do it on purpose. You know, they sort of take their time with the worship and then it's the welcome and then it's the prayers. I don't know if you've seen that clip about the little boy on YouTube where the pastor was going to baptize him and he eventually just shouted, come on, do it already. And he jumped into the water. I feel like that. Come on, just give me an opportunity now. So I'm really excited to be with you this morning. I'm a little bit nervous. I don't know why. Maybe it's because my mom's visiting. Um, Welcome, mom. Um, During the past two months, we spend quite a lot of time teaching and preaching on the Holy Spirit. And um, we spoke about the baptism of the Spirit. We spoke about receiving the Holy Spirit. We spoke about the gifts of the Holy Spirit and specifically tongues. We spoke about the promise of the Holy Spirit. And we spoke about power and glory. And I was quite inspired, and I think it was after your sermon, Judah, about power and glory, to go back to our workplace and teach on the Holy Spirit. We have um, prayer meetings at our factory every uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, short five-minute slots, and for a long time, I've been very hesitant to preach on the Holy Spirit, and I don't know why. But I felt a a release after Judah's sermon. I felt bold enough and with confidence I set out to teach on the Holy Spirit. We spoke about who is the Holy Spirit. We spoke about what does the Holy Spirit do. And we spoke about how I can be filled with the Spirit. And I was reminded again of what the Holy Spirit actually does come and do. Because the Holy Spirit comes and makes our faith alive. Amen. He, um, Nicky Gumbel, who's the pastor at Holy Trinity Brompton in London, he developed the Alpha course to what it is today. And you heard Lunard mention that we are running an Alpha course for teenagers. And um, he used an analogy to liken the Holy Spirit to a gas geyser. And he used the analogy of a, the pilot light. I don't know how, who knows a gas geyser. You know that pilot light in the gas geyser? And he said, some of our, some Christians is running on that pilot light. He says, but when the spirit comes upon you, it's like when you turn on that hot water and the, and that light goes. And that's what the spirit does. He makes our faith alive. He gives us boldness and he gives us confidence. He brings new perspectives to kingdom living. And then one of the things that he also does which I really like, is he brings a family likeness. He brings the characteristics of the Spirit, of the Father, the power gifts and the fruits, love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness. And that's something you notice in Christians when you travel the world. There's a family likeness in Spirit-filled Christians. So we're going to move on from talking about the Holy Spirit, and we're going to start looking at what does a Spirit-filled congregation look like, and what do they need to do, or a Spirit-filled Christian. And my topic today is liberty under control. That's quite a heavy topic for a Dutchman. (laughs) A while ago, Janis Labeskachny from the base church, we have a, a connection with them, Remembrance and the base He was teaching here, and he was talking on something similar. How does a spirit-filled congregation, what they can do, and how they can be effective? And he said one thing that stuck with me. He said that a spirit-filled congregation has the ability or should have the ability to change the culture of their community. Amen? And, And that resonated with me, and I want to, and that adds nicely to what I want to share with you this morning. But before I start with that, with, with, with the teaching, I would like to share with you something that also fits in nicely with what I want to share with you this morning. And it blessed me in a, in a mighty way. The Remembrance men are currently working through a book called The Book of Mysteries, written by Jonathan Kahn. Every morning, Anton shares with us uh, a little daily devotional. 
And the content or the context really, it's about a teacher and a student in the desert. And the teacher's revealing some of the mysteries of the word of God to him through a piece every day. And this particular piece that he shared was titled The Emmanuel Solution. And I'd like to share that with you this morning because it's a profound teaching. And I'll pray that it'll touch your heart as well. The Emmanuel Solution. It was early evening, just after dinner. The teacher and I were sitting by the campfire along with others. He was holding a cup, an empty cup, he said. How do we get rid of its emptiness? There's only one way, by filling it. So the teacher went over to the fountain and filled the cup with water. We have successfully removed the emptiness, he said with a slight smile. Not by focusing on the emptiness or by concentrating on removing it. We remove the emptiness by simply filling the cup with water. A simple solution, yet profound, even revolutionary if you apply it to life. How did God accomplish salvation? By removing evil from the world? No, by his presence, by coming into the world, by coming God, by becoming God with us, Emmanuel. By pouring water into the cup, I said, exactly, replied the teacher. He didn't take away our problems or remove them from the world. He did something better. He gave us the answer. He poured the water, he poured the answer into the world. You see, salvation is not the absence of sin. It's the presence of God. Salvation is not removing of the, it's not the removing of the world's darkness. It's the shining of God's light into the darkness. And by the light, the darkness is driven away. Salvation is the incarnation of God. It's his presence. It's Yeshua. It's the Emmanuel solution. So what does it reveal? You don't overcome the darkness by focusing on the darkness. You overcome the darkness by focusing on the light. Yes, and you don't overcome sin by dwelling on sin. You overcome sin by dwelling not on sin, but on God. You overcome emptiness by dwelling on his presence. You solve your problem not by dwelling on your problem, but by dwelling on the answer, by being filled up by the answer. You overcome sorrow by the presence of joy and hate by the presence of love and evil by the presence of good. Apply this secret and it will change your life. Overcome the absence by the presence of its opposite. It's as simple and as deep as pouring water into a cup, the Emmanuel solution. Amen. Isn't that a profound teaching? Now, when I read this, when I read this, I thought about the, Paul, the, the words of Paul in Ephesians 5.18, where he says, do not get drunk on wine because it leads to dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, the theological implications of be filled with the Holy Spirit makes it clear that it's a command for all Christians. And the Greek present tense here, be filled, that is used here, rules out any once for all reception of the Spirit. It points to a continuous replenishment. It's not like salvation, which is a once-off occurrence. Be filled with the Spirit is something that you can do continuously. Continuously receive new power. Continuously receive new perspective. Continuously be emboldened by the Spirit. That's what the Holy Spirit does. So I want to talk about liberty under control this morning. And it sounds a, lit like a, a bit like a contradiction, doesn't it? I mean, when I speak about, when I say the word liberty, what words comes to mind? Freedom, free, without restrictions, yes, not oppressed, 
to act as you please. Just a reminder, if you're visiting, um, Judah established a rule, so each person gets 12 amens. Please feel free to use them throughout the, the sermon. We like congregation participation. There we go. Thank you, Sunay. When I say control, what are the words that jumps to mind? You can't say I'm controlled by my wife. It's not going to work. <laughs> Sorry? Restraint. Restraint, control, okay. Power to influence, yes. Direct people's behavior, yes. Or the course of events. Determine the outcomes. So how do we make the link between liberty and control as a spiritual congregation or as a spiritual Christian? Christianity or Christian liberty allows us to live, to move, and to serve the Lord with purpose. Its characteristics are dictated by the living word and family likeness produced by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Let me say that again. Christian liberty allows us to live and move and serve the Lord with purpose. Its characteristics are dictated by the living word and family likeness produced by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. To live, liberty frees us from the bondage of sinful, selfish desires and allows us to embrace the mind of Christ. Paul says, in Philippians 2, he says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If we allow the spirit to fill us continuously, if we are filled with the answer, then our minds are transformed into the mind of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 3, 17, it says, now the Lord is the spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom. Now this specific text talks about something, talks about Moses who, when he received the law from, uh, from, from the Father, from God, the radiance, the countenance of the Lord, the glory of the Father was so bright that when he went down to present the laws to the people of Israel, they couldn't look at him and he had to cover his face with a veil because of the glory of the Lord that was so bright. And what the scripture is talking about is says what Jesus made possible is for us to have liberty, freedom to enter into the presence of the Lord without a veil. And this is what this scripture is talking about specifically. However, if we want to walk, live, serve and move in this freedom, there is something required from us. There is something that we need to do. Otherwise, we stay in the opposite of liberty in an oppressed state, in prison. We don't experience the liberty or the freedom that comes with what the Spirit has to offer, which come with what God brings. So I want us, if you've got your Bibles, turn to Acts 12. We're going to read from verse 5. And while you're turning there, I want to just give you some background. So in Acts, we read that was when the church started. In Acts 2 and Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the 3,000, and they were bold. They were, they were um, filled with boldness to preach the gospel with confidence. And the church started growing. The church gained momentum. And the king at the time, King Herod, he didn't like that. And he was harassing the church to such a point where he captured James and he killed him, James, the brother of John. And he, because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he also captured Peter and he put him in jail. And he was going to deliver him to the Jews the following day or just after Passover. So we pick up from verse 5, Acts 12, verse 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by the church. And when Herod was about to bring him out that night, Peter was sleeping, bound with two chains between two soldiers, and the guards before the door were keeping the prison. So we see that he was heavily guarded. He was chained to two prisoners on his left and on his right. He was in a prison. I think it talks about 16 in total guards that were guarding or watching Peter. 
Now, the next scripture is a very interesting portion of scripture, verse 7. Because I noticed something different in the interaction between the angel and Peter as to how I relate to God, the Father. The angel, or this angel, represents an appearance of God. But Peter doesn't know it yet. And this is an aggressive attempt to free Peter, to make him alert of what he's about to do. And the angel doesn't have time to explain to Peter what is going to happen. Peter just has to move forward with, by faith without explanation. Say that with me loudly. Move forward, move forward. by faith, faith. without explanation. Listen to verse 7. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And then the angel said to him, Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. And he said to him, Put on your garment and follow me. So we're going to look at those three commands, but I just want to pause for a second at this phrase. And he struck Peter on his side. Now I don't go into the theological explanation of that term, but I sense, and, I, and, I, and I, there was a, a certain urgency that the angel had to get Peter's attention. But I sense there's people here, not I sense, I think the Holy Spirit is, um, is impressing on my heart that there's people here that needs to get a loving strike on the side this morning. Because God wants you to wake up, because maybe you are caught in a state of being oppressed. And he doesn't want you to end up like James with your head rolling on the floor. Scripture says, those who have ears, listen. So listen. Because God might want to say something to you this morning through this message. Amen? Amen? So there's three commands. The first one was quick, get up. Now I would probably say in this situation, if it was me, how? I'm chained on my left and on my right. How do you expect me to get up when I'm chained to something bigger than me? Have you ever felt like that? Have you ever been chained to something bigger than you and you can't get up? You can't get out? You don't think, how am I going to get out of this position? Maybe it's got to do with your finances. Maybe it's got to do with your marriage. Maybe it's got to do with your business. How do you expect me to get up if I'm, if I'm chained to something bigger than me? Notice what Peter did. He got up and the chains fell off. Not the other way around. You know how I would like it to work? I would like the chains to fall off first and then I'll get up. God, please give me a sign and then I'll obey. Give me a desire and then I'll move. You obey, and then you develop the desire to obey further. Because you obey. You can't say, well, I'm like those people, and limit yourself to your current state of progress, because freedom comes through obedience. How many of you have been delivered from something that you thought, this is bigger than me, I'll never be free? Hmm? Amen. You did not get free by asking more questions as to how. You got free by taking action. True? You reached out to somebody. You asked. You knocked. You seek. You went to God with the problem. Peter didn't ask for an explanation first as to how. What about the gods? What if they wake up? He took action. 
He got up and then the chains fell off. He could have waited for an answer. He could have waited for God to place a desire in his heart. But he would probably have died the next day if he did. He acted. We don't always get anywhere by waiting for God to explain everything to us. You might get to a place of anxiety. You might get to a place of fear. You might get to a place of depression. You might get to a place of oppression if you sit and remain chained. The second command, the angel said, gird yourself and tie on your sandals. I would probably have said, why? What for? For my execution? Have you ever been there? Peter learned a lot from spending his time with Jesus in ministry. Because Peter was always the one that asked the questions. He was the one that said to Jesus, you shouldn't go to Jerusalem because you're going to be crucified. They will kill you there. And Jesus had to say to him, Jesus had to reprimand him, say, I have to go. I have to be, they have to catch me. They have to capture me. They have to crucify me. Blood has to spill so that I can send the promise. So can I, so that I can provide the solution. Now Peter is just doing what God tells him in the absence of answers. The angel didn't explain and said, good news, we're getting out of jail. He just said, get up. He didn't show him everything all at once. We can take the scripture as a model for our unanswered prayers. Gird yourself and tie on your sandals. And so he did. If we get stuck in the how and the why, we might get our heads chopped off. We might miss the blessing. We might miss the opportunity for God to use us in a mighty way. The third command, and probably the most difficult one, was he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. What would your answer be? Where? Peter didn't question. He says, I'm coming with he said, I'm going. I would probably say, well, as long as the work opportunities are good, economy is thriving, cost of living is low, there's no load shedding, there's no taxi strikes or riots, and there's good schools. We have to let God know we're coming with, even if Psalm 23 becomes a reality in your life. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because you are with me. Say it out loud. God is with me. God is me. Amen. And that's my confidence. And that's what I know. And that's how I hold on to my salvation in this season. And that's why I'm not going to let my head hang low. That's why I'm not going to have a panic attack and be caught in fear or be oppressed. I'm not going to try and control the situation by human means. I'm not going to ask why, how, and where. I'm not going to try and produce an answer through my own flesh. I'm going to rely on God because he is with me. So the scripture in verse 9 carries on and said, So he went out and followed him, and they did not know what that and and did not know that what was done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they were past the first and the second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads to the city, which opened to them of its own accord. They had motion detection in those days. And they went down the street, and immediately the angel departed from him. How many of us are standing there waiting for an answer? And God is waiting for an action. So he can jump in and pour himself into the situation. The last time when I, when I preached here, I said, God is waiting for us to engage with him in prayer so he can rend heavens open and stretch his arm out and become involved in your situation to provide a solution, to provide an answer. 
We have to move forward by faith without explanation sometimes. Christian liberty allows us to live, move, and serve the Lord with purpose. When we talk about move, Psalm 119, 45 says, And I will walk at liberty, for I seek your precepts. That is your teachings, your guidelines, your instructions. God's law is not restrictive. It only restricts from things that harms us, and it liberates man to walk in the fullness of God's perfect plan. This is his precepts. This is his guidelines. This is his law. It says, Bible, basic instructions before leaving earth. Hosea says, my people perish because of a lack of knowledge. You need to fill your mind. You need to get the mind of Christ. You need to pour this answer into your situation. John 8, 34. Uh, actually, 31 says, Then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Most assuredly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. Do you know that sometimes we fail to walk in the liberty or in the freedom due to a lack of identity, a lack of truth? Lunat spoke a bit about foundations. I'm grateful for the teachings of foundations in this congregation because it helps us to all be on the same page with regards to the truth, the instructions. Our, um, our grandson visited with us uh, this past week. He spent two nights with us, and it was quite nice to have him there. And um, the first evening, he was playing in the bath. He was there, he likes to bath. He was there for a very long time. Nikki put his clothes out on the bed, and um, he started calling for us. And I went to him. I said, okay, come out. Get dressed. He's big enough now to start doing it himself. Dry yourself, get dressed, and come, with, come to us. We're sitting in the dining room. And the next minute, he came running up to the dining room, half-dressed, still wet. And he's sick, and his hair's wet. So I say to him, Nikki said, I didn't say to him. She said, I barked at him. I said to him, get back to the bathroom, go get the towel so I can dry your hair. You're going to uh, be more sick. And he was tearful. He started crying because he said, I'm scared. I'm scared to go down this long, dark passage. And in that moment, I realized that's how we are sometimes. Because the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. You have the liberty and you have the control and you have the authority to move in the house of the Lord without being fearful. Liberty and freedom to abide, abide in his house as a son, not as a slave. The last scripture, and I'm ending off with this, is in, comes from Luke 4. Verse 18 to 19, this is Jesus speaking here, and he's fulfilling a prophecy, a prophecy of Isaiah 61. And he says the following in the synagogue, he, he reads, and he says the following, he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed. That's what a spiritful congregation, that's what a spiritual Christian is supposed to do, to set the captives free. Scripture says, and signs and wonders will follow. Amen? We've seen signs and wonders here. We've seen 
captives set free. You can either be a thermometer, gauge the degree of hotness or coldness in your room, at your office, with your friends, around the braai, with your family, and then sit back, bound in chains, and join the chorus to say how and why. Or you can be a thermostat, and you can regulate the temperature. You can regulate the conditions. You can control the outcomes. You have the power and the authority to influence, to direct the conditions, and ultimately determine the outcomes. Why? Because you're a son and a daughter of a king. Because you're established in identity. Because you have liberty, because the son has set you free. And you have the control to do that. Amen? Amen. I am... Um, I'd like to end off, end off with a uh, with seeing that we've launched uh, Retestify with a very short testimony myself, and um, and it's uh, it's um, I didn't know it at first, but it ties in with liberty and control. So I've been supporting investing in my eldest son's business a little bit that's not yet making enough money. I don't think it's making money yet. I think Luke's online, hello Luke. Um, anyway, we, um, part of this business and for him to generate income is based on an online platform that um, needs to be written. I don't know if we've got any coders here or people who write programs. Oh, thank you. So, so he, he contracted this firm in Cape Town, and they are writing the code, the source code for this online platform. It's quite a comprehensive uh, um, platform. It speaks to the customer and the, 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 the vendor or the service provider, and it links a whole lot of thing, uh, things in the background. Long story short, these people, or this company, the service provider has been dragging things out. And every time we go back to them and say, but this is unfair because we agreed on the scope, we agreed on these deliverables. And then they come back and say, well, this is not a, <laughs> they come back and say, well, we need more time, we need more money. And we don't have more money and we don't have more time because his business, he needs to start making money. And eventually, in the beginning of the year, we had a big meeting and we decided, okay, we will reduce the scope of work and just do the most important aspects that needs to be written into this program. And they agreed to that. They put it in writing, in fact. Four months later, they missed the deadlines and they said they need more money. And this happened now in the last week, and Luke phoned me, or he sent me a message, or he phoned me, sorry, and said I was on my way to a customer myself. And he said, this is what they say. And at that moment, I was so f frustrated, I was cross, and I was trying to internalize and digest what they are saying. And I was thinking, God, this is so unfair. If we did something wrong, then yes, it's fine but we didn't. We were honest. We were ethical in our approach. We paid on time. And then I got back to the office that afternoon and Luke had sent a reply mail to the, to, to the service provider, but he sent it to me first. And he said, this is what I want to say. And obviously it, it wasn't the right thing to say at the time. And I said, no, you can't say that. I said, send me some of the information so I can have a look at it again. And when I sent the mail back to him to ask this, when I pressed send, I prayed. I took the liberty to pray because I know my identity in God. I said, God, this is not right. If I'm a son of a king, 
I'm not a slave. If I have freedom to move in your house without fear, and if I do the things right, kingdom living right, why are we being attacked? Why are we being treated like this unfairly? The mail was probably 15 minutes later after I sent the mail, Luke phoned me. And he said the people phoned him, the senior accounts manager. And she said, we have to apologize to you. We are wrong. We now realize what we've done. We understand your position. Now, maybe they decided it beforehand. But we, just, we, we started praying for an answer. We pr started praying for God to intervene. We serve a mighty Lord. We should never underestimate the authority and the control and the freedom we have to approach our Father. Amen. 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 Thank you very much. Thank you for taking the time to listen and we hope you've been blessed. For more information, visit readchurchza.com.